Greetings, folks. You're about to witness the birth of modern chemistry as we discover the fundamental physics that govern the electronic structure and reactivity of atoms. As we've seen many times before, the grand discoveries didn't happen linearly, but they evolved as more and more interesting experimental data accumulated. Bohr could explain many properties of atoms with his initial sketch of the atomic structure with the nucleus and electrons locked in circular stationary state orbits. And I think one of his greatest discoveries was finding that reactivity and the shape of the periodic table were dependent on the electronic structure of the atom. But after Bohr, progress stalled. Slowly, several experimental and theoretical curiosities would begin to crop up that would require a more refined and general model of the atom. And we need to remember, we, we have yet to find an equation like Newton's F equals MA or Einstein's relativity theory that would be applicable in accurately calculating motion and energy at the atomic level. So let's look at four of the curiosities that came about that would lead us to a new atomic theory. Two spectroscopists, George Living and Sir James Duar, published many papers from 1872 to 1880 describing the line spectra of a great number of elements. Some spectra are on the slide. Now, if you look closely at the line spectra, you probably can see that not all the spectral lines look the same or have the same intensity and shape. Some of them have different widths, some are even fuzzy looking, and some are darker than others. The darker the line, the more intense the light. Now, Dewar and Living noticed patterns and similarities in the lines and began to characterize the lines as either sharp lines, principal lines, diffuse lines, fundamental lines, and so on. And there was nothing in the Bohr atom that could explain these observations and the patterns of shapes and intensities. In the 1890s, Charles Wilson invented what is known as the cloud chamber. When an electron zips through the chamber, it leaves a condensation trail behind it, like when a plane produces a condensation trail as it moves across the sky. Now, it was the nearest anyone could come in that day to seeing an individual electron. Now, this idea of being able to track the history and the electron's trajectory would become a very puzzling result to the early fathers of the new physics. In 1922, Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach performed an experiment where they fired silver atoms through a magnetic field and struck a detector. But amazingly, the atoms hit the detector in two distinct locations. Okay, we got nothing to explain this result. Why would two identical atoms self-select into two different types of atoms on the detector? In 1924, a young French physicist, Louis de Broglie, wrote a PhD dissertation in which he claimed that analogous to light, matter also has a wave-particle duality, which we can call a matter wave. He could capture this relationship for the matter in an amazingly simple and elegant equation. In the equation, m is the mass of the particle times the Greek letter nu, which is the speed of the particle. The product equals the ratio of Planck's constant, yes, the very same constant Einstein used in his light energy equation, and the wavelength of the particle lambda. This wave nature of matter is not easily seen in bulk matter or large particles the size of humans, but for a tiny, fast-moving electron, it would be measurable. For example, if we plug in some numbers for an electron having a mass of 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, moving at 1,000 meters per second, where Planck's constant is the well-known value of 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds, the resultant wavelength of an electron matter wave would be 727.4 nanometers. Yes, still very small, but on the order of light and measurable with modern equipment. All these curiosities would prove to be experimental verification of a new theory and provide critical realizations and pictures that would guide us to the new physics that we would lovingly call quantum mechanics. This new theory 
would establish the modern age of science and would open the floodgates to our understanding of the true nature of matter and of chemistry. Niels Bohr had a brilliant protege named Werner Heisenberg who would attempt to solve the problem of the different intensities and shapes of the spectral lines of the hydrogen emission. Now in doing so, he would discover in 1925, with considerable help from the mathematicians Max Born and Pasquale Jordan, a wonderful new relationship, an equation in the form of matrices that seemed to agree with the particle's motion and energy at the atomic level. Now later in that year, the young scientist Wolfgang Pauli would use this new matrix mechanics to solve the hydrogen atom, reproducing the line spectrum and obtaining energies identical to Bohr's results. Okay, in that same year, Erwin Schrödinger, building upon the particle wave nature of matter of de Broglie, derived what is now called the wave equation, H psi equals E psi. Now this famous version of this equation is a simplified time independent version where the H is called a Hamiltonian operator and mathematical operators have hats on them and H represents an energy measurement. E is the energy result of the measurement and the Greek letter psi is the system that is being measured, in this case the stationary state at the atomic level. Bohr had postulated the stationary states in his work, but now the stationary states would pop out of the quantum equations. Schrodinger would use his equation to also solve the hydrogen atom and obtain Bohr's energy results. Wow. Now, it looks like we have two different equations that govern the atom, but Schrodinger in 1926 would prove that both equations are mathematically the same. Because of the ease of computation and interpretation, chemists tend to use the Schrodinger equation rather than the matrix equations of Heisenberg. Yes, now we're getting somewhere. We have our atomic level quantum equations, so things are going to move rapidly now. So buckle up, we'll catch you in the next lecture.